Hello, welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. My name is Don Claser, and with me today are Dr. Timothy Day from the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club and Mr. Leo McMaster, eighth grade science teacher at Lincoln Park Middle School. And both of these gentlemen are involved with the restoration of the observatory at Lincoln Park High School. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Tim, how did you become involved in this project? I'm somebody who's always been excited about astronomy at an amateur level since I was just a little kid. I can remember going to the library and checking out every book I could find about the subject when I was growing up and being all excited about the astronauts and the Apollo space shot and uh, just the way some children follow dinosaurs and can tell you all the names or baseball cards and the players. I was that way about astronomy. So when I moved to Lincoln Park, I've been a resident for about 10 years, I would, of course, drive past the school every so often on Champaign, and I saw this uniquely shaped building, about 14 feet in diameter, with an unmistakable dome and a shutter that clearly opened up and down on it. And I said to myself, that has got to house one large telescope in there. But I never heard anything about it. I asked people, and. Uh, they would say, they would kind of shrug and say, it's just always been there. We don't know anything about it. I see. And uh, that sparked your interest to uh, find out more about it? I went to the superintendent of schools in 2001, uh, Randy Kite, and I uh, sat down in his office and I asked him, is there a telescope in there? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, well, what can you tell me about it? And he goes, well, not very much. And I said, when was the last time it was used? Uh, how big is it? And he, he was unable to answer any of those questions uh, because it had been so long since it had gotten any active use. What he did do was provide me with a key to the shed. And uh, so one evening while there was a football game going on, I went out there and opened up the shed and went in to look at the telescope and saw to my surprise this enormous nine foot long tube and a giant scaffolding to climb up and look through the eyepiece. Uh, and saw that the motor still rotated the dome and opened the shutter and whatnot, and uh, uh, began to do those things and climb up and peer in. What happened is about half of the stands on that side watching the football game emptied out and got in line to look through the telescope. It was as if I had opened Tutankhamun's tomb. <laughs> there was such excitement. Uh, I, it was with the regret I had to say, no, I can't let you in here tonight. But uh, from that point on, I had always had a spark to, what can we do to get this thing fixed up? Interesting. Uh, what's some of the history of the observatory? Can you tell us? It was originally built in uh, 1964 to house the telescope, the mirror of which was hand ground by a science teacher in 1961, a science teacher at the same medical middle school uh, that Leo is at now. Well, different building, it's right? Junior it was Huff Junior High back then, right? Um, and the, the, uh, the science teacher would have his class take a blank piece of glass and just spend an entire semester grinding it by hand. It's almost a lost art now. And they would make these incredible reflective mirrors and they would install them in a tube and it would be a Newtonian style telescope. And the, well, I guess what he did is over the course of his career teaching there is move from small sizes all the way up to his masterpiece which got housed in this observatory. The mirror, the final mirror, was uh, 12 and a half inches uh, in diameter and almost perfectly ground. Uh, they then put it into a giant cylinder, a tube with the eyepiece at the correct place to be able to see the light as it became focused. And they lugged it in and out for three years of the classroom. Uh, I'm assuming somebody said enough. And they <laughs> built the dome in 1964 and it had a permanent pier and the motorized you know, uh, turning of the mechanism and so on and so forth. It fell into disuse when he left the school system. He retired in 1968, and there was nobody to sort of carry on the spirit and the momentum uh, until about 1975. In 1975, I found out by going to the Lincoln Park Historical Museum and researching some documents with the help of Muriel Lobb that there was actually a, a, a club formed at that time, and they re-silvered the mirror and actually bought a camera and started taking some photographs through it and cleaned it up. and. That lasted a couple more years, mm -hmm. and then it fell into disuse a second time. Until you happened to Until we happened to come across it. Now, I first started having an interest in it in 2001 
nothing actually took place in terms of renovation until just this last fall. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Leo, what does the renovation of the observatory mean to the students at, at the Lincoln Park schools? I just, it's the ultimate hands-on experience, you know, teaching out of a textbook, they're showing, you can show clips of video, you, can, you know, it just, it gives a, the, the best hands-on opportunity compared to those types of teaching strategies. Uh, they can look up through this telescope and actually see the rings of Saturn or, I just think, you know, right now you can teach the phases of the moon, I just, th this will be the aha, It'll be, it, you, you know, when you go out night to night, week to week, and actually look at these objects and they can understand how they move and actually, I think there's going to be some ownership to what they're learning. Um, and I'm hoping that a lot of pride, you know, it's, it's, it's a unique thing for Lincoln Park to have such a tool as this. I like the idea of kids coming and bringing their parents, bringing their other relatives, their little brothers and sisters. and. And then that'll start some excitement in the earlier ages before they even get to the middle school. The learning opportunities are still kind of, you know, up in the air. They, they, like I said, they can, they can chart the, there's going to be a solar scope involved. Uh, Mr. Day can tell you kind of the, the, the whole, um, all the hardware that we've purchased, but there's going to be a solar scope. So we'll actually be able to, and I believe it's going to be wired into the classroom, so we'll actually be able to um, look at the, the sun during the day. Absolutely. Okay, and yeah. I like the idea of maybe they could have a project where they chart the movement of the uh, sunspots. So, I mean, there's just the, in the grant that I wrote, which we'll talk more about, I, there were many, you know, one lesson plan at, at, after another were popping up that, that, you know, hopefully will become a reality with this. Sounds very exciting. Now, it sounds like this is quite an involved project, gentlemen. Uh, you're putting in a lot of new equipment. Uh, how were the necessary funds raised for this project? Well, after having a chance to play with the original telescope for a little bit, what became obvious uh, was that it wasn't going to be something worth salvaging. It was a magnificent instrument in its day, but the mirror would need to be uh, re-silvered one more time, and uh, the mount is not motorized. It was a push sort of a mechanism, and there was an enormous scaffolding uh, that would take the students some 12 feet off the floor in order to view through the eyepiece when the telescope was looking at something up high in the sky. And the scaffolding itself was on wheels. Uh, that's sort of discouraged nowadays in today's climate. Uh, so a decision was made uh, that the best option might be to look for grant monies to completely replace the telescope with something far more modern. And that's exactly what we went about doing. Yeah, there was an email I received from my, another superintendent, uh, Richard Rockwell, who's been a big help in this project as well. And it described the Toshiba America grant um, for the company. Uh, uh, primarily, um, there's, there's the electronics division, and then this is uh, just a, a, an offshoot that's responsible for community out, out um It's out a foundation, yeah. yeah, foundation. And property. they um, offered uh, a large amount of, you know, large grant for those that were worthy and kind of consumed, got consumed in it for about three weeks, about a year ago, calling uh, Tim and, uh, you know, emailing different drafts, and it, it finally, you know, sent it out about a year ago, I want to say, this month. And you were successful, obviously, in receiving mm -hmm. the grant. That's uh, uh, really right. quite exciting. I want to say around uh, Christmas time. Yep, I think uh, so. We, uh, a representative, Natalie Ginter, came out and um, provided us with the check, $15,000 to buy all the, the, the hardware that we proposed. What's some of the equipment that'll be in the observatory, Tim? With the $15,000, I went to Ralph Emerson, who's the Director of Educational Outreach at Oceanside Photo and Telescope out in California, and said, what can you do for our school system? What can, how, what's the best way to spend this money? And he sat down with his team and thought about it and, and came up with a list of uh, things that we could afford with that money and the most obvious place to start is the telescope itself. The optical tube assembly is a, a Celestron and it's got a 14 inch mirror in it and it's a magnificent instrument. Uh, it will just last for a very very long time and you can see you can use it to see uh, uh, just amazing and remarkable things. The next most important component is the mount that holds that long tube that's replacing the one that was in there and this mount will go on the same concrete pier in the center 
but it will be uh, completely computerized and it's a beautiful piece of machinery. It's made by Los Mondi, it's the Titan series mount and it will be connected uh, with wires to a computer that will be installed in the observatory and controlled by software and the computer will allow the mount to swivel the telescope to point exactly where you want it to go and then to stay there, track it as the earth rotates and keep your subject dead center. Uh, and that's of course extremely important not just for visual observing but for photographic uh, or video camera type uh, use as well. All right, so it sounds like you'll have these important uh, pieces of equipment and some of the other things that make all of this possible. Well, uh, he, uh, Leo mentioned earlier that we'll have uh, a solar scope made by Lunt. It's a, a wonderful instrument. It will be mounted onto the optical tube, the Celestron itself, and uh, we'll be able to use it to see not just sunspots, but solar flares and prominences and things like that. And it's a nice time to be getting one because the solar cycle is just at the point where it's starting to get more active again. So as the, the next uh, 10 years or so go by, uh, the students should see more and more to look at through it. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a, a very fine video camera that it goes in where the eyepiece would normally fit, on either the solar scope or the regular scope. Mm -hmm. That can attach to the computer. The computer is attached to the school's internet, and the students will be able to see whatever it is you would see with your eye, but with the video camera instead. I see. Leo, can you tell me briefly, what's the long-term goal of this project? I think the biggest goal is that the telescope gets used, um, primarily for um, academic use, but also we're hoping that for public use, for the citizens of Lincoln Park and the surrounding Downriver area. Um, he mentioned how back in 1975, how there was a, uh, you know, they, they got excited about the telescope mm -hmm. again, and then it went and it, and it kind of was, you know, gathering cobwebs. Uh, I think the, with the, the help of the Ford Am Am Amateurs Astronomy Club being part of the project, that this won't happen this time. You know, we, we've, we've, we're going to get it in place and it's going to be something that will be used for a long time. Also, I think it'll be neat that once my students move out of the high school, they'll come back and they'll use it and hopefully their projects will get a little bit more complicated. Maybe their high school physics teacher will come up with some ways of using it to, uh, I don't know, chart whatever asteroids or what, whatever it, it could lead to. That sounds great, Leo. We're going to have to take a, a short break right now. Uh, I did want to remind all of our viewers about our website that you can visit to get information about our program. You can see it down at the bottom of your screen. And right after this short public service announcement, we'll be back with a couple of other members of this committee for the Lincoln Park Observatory Restoration Project. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our program. Joining me now are George Carotti, a member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, and Joe Griggs, president of Joseph P. Griggs Renovation, Historical Renovation and Building Company. Gentlemen, welcome. Now, Tim, in the first part of our program, it really seemed that this was an involved project. Did you have to get anybody special involved with this? We did indeed. One of the obstacles we discovered early on after we took out the old telescope and had received the new telescope from OPT was that birds had managed to get inside of the observatory. In fact, there was nests uh, and straw and all sorts of uh, material inside the observatory and the school was concerned that this might be considered hazardous waste and it might be a danger to the workers or other people who came in. I went to the Lincoln Park Historical Society and went, approached Muriel Lobb, who had given me some help up to that point just doing research, and presented her with this problem that uh, the school thought it would cost roughly $1,800 just to bring in a special hazmat team to clean out the building to the point where they were satisfied it was safe for people to enter in. Um, she said, well, why don't you talk to Joseph Griggs? 
and uh, in fact placed a cell phone call and I think Joseph was there within about half an hour and sat down at the table and I had all of my pictures laid out and Muriel was there and she introduced us and uh, Joseph got excited about the project right away and said I'm someone who can help you. Sounds great. Well Joseph what were some of the problems that you had to overcome in restoring the observatory? Well first we had to get past the school board and the need to take, make sure that there was no harmful paint such as lead-based paint dealing with the fact of it being so old the fact of the bird droppings and that, we didn't know what else was in there, so we had the ESMIC team come in, which I have a, one of my members of my group is a Leo Buck, who's a certified trainer for asthma, so it was no problem. He came through, looked at it, certified it off to me, and then I took it to the rest of my team. Right, and then where did you go once the building was safe to work <sighs> on? It was interesting. Um, my first concern was um, dealing with the electrical being at the standards of 1960 compared to now, they're using a bonding unit where uh, everything's put in pipes and grounded that way. Um, I realized that it probably need a secondary ground and it had push matics which is very old fashioned. So I got a hold of Jim Hill, who is a master electrician on uh, Southgate Electrical, he owns it. And uh, he came and he told me that change it over to a square D box and extend it out and run all new conduit down underneath the floor and then back up the other side. At that point, then we realized that we were going to be tearing out a cement floor and more costs are getting involved as we go along. And of course, we're donating everything that we can or trying to get people to support it by making donations and materials, whatever. What happened was, in the meantime, they were telling me that the show needed to be eight inches higher off the floor. So we decided, to, let's raise the floor, run the conduit under that, run up a couple side walls, put a panel in for the uh, new computer, set another panel on the other side, and hook up the uh, fuse box, which will extend from the original, so everything's still there, and then add a grounding rod. Then from there, we're gonna run a line underground so the wires won't interfere with the telescope, and they're gonna put in a pole for us, and everything can go up that way, and then we're gonna make uh, the capability of changing and adding uh, low boat, high boat uh, conduit that's ready at time. The other thing is ADA requirements. Uh, according to ADA, um, you, when that you would have, be the Americans with Disabilities. Yes, right? yes. Okay. And uh, the, what we got to have to work on that is that one, we have to make it so that a child or a grown that wants to go to the telescope can get in there in a wheelchair, or if they have uh, confinements or uh, equipment. So what we're going to raise the floor up, then go outside, have a ramp out of cement that will come back to ground level. We'll widen out wide enough so that we can put out benches and make it a, a very pleasable, wonderful place for the community to use. Great. Were there any problems with the dome itself being able to turn or that shutter to open? Um, actually, by the time I, uh, I was uh, there the last time and looked at it, um, it's, it's sound as far as working. I'm not too sure on continuous ground, and I'm not too I'm not too sure about uh, the secondary uh, grounding for everything else. So I'm going to have Jim come back and make sure that we do it right, because the old motors are not quite the same as the new ones. We want to update everything, and at the same time make it safe. You're still going to have children and adults playing with a, an instrument that has to be grounded correctly, because you never know what's going to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Well. As we talked earlier, the observatory's been there since 1964. Uh, George, can you tell us about the condition of the telescope after so many years of neglect? Yes, uh, it was quite a shock to walk into that observatory uh, when the door was first opened the first time it went in there and see bird nests, uh, debris, uh, dust accumulation, uh, rust, uh, it, it was quite a shock, but it's, it's, it's understandable of not being used for 30 or 40 years. And uh, uh, so when we start looking into the equipment, uh, we found out that the covers had been uh, deteriorated off the telescope in bird droppings and in insects and in dust uh, was able to get down into the, uh, into the optics and uh, caused a problem uh, with, uh, with, with the mirrors. And uh, I, uh, we took the mirror out and uh, I tested the mirror, it was outstanding uh, figure on the, on the mirror. That was an outstanding job that the school had done. But uh, the mirror was etched with the bird droppings and uh, I cleaned it up and uh, tested it and like I say, it was a fine mirror. But as far as reusing that mirror again, it would have to be reground and that wouldn't be practical or economically feasible. 
Uh, the rest of the, the tube was deteriorated and paint was flaking off. There was a lot of rust on uh, the metal components, but the pier itself was, was sound and the pier riser was sound. Now the rest inside of the observatory was obviously uh, dust laden and so forth, so it had to clean, be cleaned up and Joe got his crew in there and you know, did a fine job. So uh, basically that's what we found when we went in there. I see, and it was determined then at that point that perhaps the telescope that was in there originally should be replaced with a new instrument? Yes, uh, the telescope uh, when it was built was kind of state of the art. It was a Newtonian reflector, almost, uh, almost an F8, which makes it almost eight or nine feet long. Well, uh, the technology today has advanced so much that that same length of telescope can be put into, say, a telescope two feet long, which the new one will only be about two feet long. Uh, in addition to that, uh, being only, only two feet long, uh, the, the, the telescope can uh, uh, be, uh, with the electronic wizardry we have today, it can be controlled with a computer and sent out over the internet or back into the classroom. So, so it's, it was not uh, economically feasible or practical to try to refurbish the old telescope. Well, it seems like the telescope itself is an integral part of the observatory. Joe, as a member of the Lincoln Park Historical Commission, do they have any plans for the old telescope itself? I'm hoping to present it to them. That's why I'm doing the project and make it part of the history of Lincoln Park. I think it's very important to take these objects that come along that we're very fortunate to have and ma maintain them for, for the community. The biggest trouble we have is it is so big that the only place we have is outside in one of the cubby holes. We might be able to cover it with plexiglass and leave it there for people to see it. All right. Uh, could there be uh, any type of programs that you could design to uh, to let people know about the history of this instrument? The best way I can say it uh, with history is to take something like this, set it up for them to see, then take them to see the new one and see how it works, what what's available, what's possible, the dreams. That's great. Tim, it was mentioned earlier that there are a number of people and groups involved that help donate either labor or products or money. Can you uh, enlighten us on some of those uh, folks and organizations? Absolutely. To begin with, uh, the green light was given by Lincoln Park Schools. They're the ones who said, go ahead and run with this. Uh, so the initial thanks goes to them for allowing us to step in and, and to start to dream and, and to actualize the dream. The uh, next big benefactor, I would say, would be the Toshiba America Foundation. and. Uh, Leo's efforts to do the grant writing and an enormous thanks to uh, those folks for picking us. We were told that we uh, received the top award in the country for the year. Uh, the category was middle and high school science and, and mathematics but uh, uh, we were very very pleased to receive the award for fifteen thousand dollars and it was that that allowed us to then go to Oceanside Photo and Telescope and buy a research grade state-of-the-art telescope to replace what we had there. Uh, after that I would say an enormous thanks goes to uh, J.P. Griggs and his crew for the labor that they've donated. Uh, we've had the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club uh, very generously donate $500 from their funds uh, for the cost of new materials and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we've had the uh, Joseph, what was the, the Historical Society donated? The uh, Preservation Alliance. Preservation Alliance, thank you. Donated $200, is for, that right? For the floor, yes. For the flooring, yes. Uh, and uh, Bear Paint uh, donated six gallons of their premium product through Allen Park Home Depot. Allen Park Home Depot has made a number of their products available to us uh, at cost or close to it and have been very helpful. So we've been very fortunate and it's wonderful to see uh, as the project advances and more and more people find out about it, there's a momentum, there's an energy that's coming into it and, and people get excited and they begin to invest in it. And it's, so it's sort of like the farther along we go, the easier it gets. Uh, and it's wonderful to have the sense of community, the excitement associated with it. And the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club will be providing support in terms of outreach uh, programming and uh, technical support? Absolutely. Leo touched on an important part earlier. We want to avoid the cycle of boom and bust. 
So Hector Robinson, the science teacher who originally did the grinding of the mirror and, and built the observatory, and there's a beautiful plaque inside that still has his name on it in the year 1964. Um, when he left, it fell into disuse. And in the mid-1970s, there was a brief revival, but that only lasted a couple of years. So now that we've got this big investment in a research-grade uh, telescope and, and uh, automation and all that, we want to avoid a third cycle of boom and bust. And the, the plan is to have the members of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club have access basically in perpetuity for their club members to the telescope and they are uh, going to come in and people like George and others have uh, generously donated their time to get the telescope mounted and up and running and the software working properly and then uh, once that's all done they will then also continue with outreach they'll help people like Leo they'll help uh, uh, amateurs like myself other members of the club and then the community at large that sounds great Tim this is a very exciting project and I understand next month You'll have first light on the scope. We'll be out there to uh, film that great event and uh, bring it to the folks of the Downriver communities. I want to thank all of my guests uh, this afternoon for being here to bring us information on this very exciting project. If you have a question for us, you can send it to the email address that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please don't go away. We've got a brief uh, stop here where we'll tell you about some upcoming events and then our segment on What's Up. We'll be right back. <music> Find out what's up in tonight's sky. Here's Stephen Witte. Uh, August is the month for the Perseid meteor shower. The Perseids peak on August 12th and 13th this year, but the moon runs interference, I recommend, the 14th, which is a Thursday, through the 17th, which is a Sunday, for best viewing. The planets in the evening are Saturn and Ceres, which set at 9.40 and 10.30. So Ceres, being fainter, is maybe easier to see. Uh, sunset is at 7.50, so you only have a couple of hours. Mercury is an evening object throughout the month, setting at about 10.45. You need a nice low horizon for Mercury all the time. Uh, Jupiter and Neptune are up most of the night from about 10 p.m. They're five degrees apart, so you may be able to catch them in a binocular view at the same time. Uranus rises around 10 p.m. and is, avail uh, is visible most of the night. In the morning, we have Venus rising at 2.30 a.m., Mars rising at 1.15 a.m., so near sunrise is best. Uh, the moon is full on the 5th. That's a Sunday. It's third quarter on Monday the 13th. It's new on Monday the 20th. It's first quarter on Tuesday the 28th. So toward the beginning of the weeks are the quarters. For a deep sky uh, challenge object, Pluto sets at 1.30 a.m. I recommend 10 p.m. It'll be 27 degrees up. It's magnitude 14. You can see it in a 10-inch scope. Very interesting, Steve, and for our viewers, if you'd like to find out more about what's up in the night sky, stop by your favorite bookseller to pick up a copy of Astronomy Magazine or Sky and Telescope Magazine. 